it's Madeline and today I'm going to be reviewing the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series by Rick Riordan. and I thought it was really well done. The action, the adventure, the characters, and even the Greek mythology. So if you don't already know what the Percy Jackson series is about, which you probably do since the first book came out like uh, 10 years ago, but it follows a boy named Percy Jackson, obviously, and he finds out that he is a half-blood or a demigod, and so that means basically that his one parent is a god and his other parent is a human or a mortal. So Percy has trouble during school, not only because he has ADHD and dyslexia, but also because odd events always happen when he's around. And Percy later finds out that this is because he is a demigod and monsters are trying to kill him. So early on in the first book, The Lightning Thief, Percy is brought to Camp Half-Blood, uh, where demigods just like him uh, come during the summer to learn how to kill um, different monsters. Early on, when Percy gets to Camp Half-Blood, he makes friends and enemies, but he also discovers that Zeus's master bolt has been stolen, and if it's not returned by the summer solstice, there is going to be a war among the gods. So Percy and some of his friends, Grover, Grover and Annabeth, go on a quest to find the master bolt, and that's basically the premise for the first story. The rest of the series is just like a bunch of adventures, quests, battles, killing monsters, it's just like really awesome in general, so I definitely recommend reading it if you haven't already. So if you haven't read all the Percy Jackson books, so that would be The Lightning Thief, The Sea of Monsters, The Titan's Curse, The Battle of the Labyrinth, and The Lost Olympian. I wouldn't suggest watching the rest of this video because I'm going to be discussing what goes down through books 1 to 5, everything in between, all the spoilers, everything. So I don't want to spoil you and you shouldn't want to spoil yourself. So what I would do is go read the books, come back, and finish watching this video. And if you have been avoiding these books because they're middle grade, just pick them up. They're, it's, they're a really good middle grade series. And if you've seen the movies and you didn't enjoy the movies and that's why you're not picking the books up, just read the books because the movies aren't very good. So anyways, if you haven't read these books. Goodbye for now. Okay, so anyways, let's start with the first book. The first book, we are introduced to Percy Jackson, obviously. Um, we just get to know 12-year-old Percy and what is going on in his life, and he discovers he's a demigod, and as he discovers he's a demigod, we are introduced to his world as well. And the great mythology aspect is so well done. It is like sprinkled on top. It's not like you're sitting in a class just learning. It's not like a huge info dump. You're just like learning as it goes in a fun way, and it's just so well done. Uh, we are introduced uh, to Annabeth, who is my all-time favorite character in the entire series, by the way. I just, I loved her. She's smart, witty, brave, oh my word, awesome. And then we have Grover. Grover, I think he needs more credit than people give him, because he isn't given a ton of credit because he's not necessarily the bravest character, but I think he does have some bravery in him because he does overcome his fears to later in the series or in this book, sorry, I guess, um, so that he can uh, fulfill his dreams, which is good. And then we have Percy, our narrator. He was just an amazing narrator. He was snarky and funny and brave and just like, this book was actually funny. You know, like, it's an action adventure book, but just some of the parts, like, reading this series is just really hilarious. So in this book, we have Percy find the Mastful, and then we learn that he got played by the gods, by Ares in particular, and when... Percy fought Ares in the end. I was I didn't think he was gonna win the battle, but he did, which is like really surprising because it's like full on god versus a twelve year old demigod and like I don't even know how he won that, but that's crazy. And I just I thought it was really good and I had already seen the movie when I was younger, so I was spoiled about Luke being a traitor. Um, but luckily for the I didn't see the second movie and it was good for the uh, last four books, so it was great. And in The Sea of Monsters, this one, we are introduced to Tyson, who is Percy's half-brother, and he's also a cyclop. At first, Percy's not happy about Tyson being his half-brother because everyone's making fun of him for having a cyclops as a brother. And, you know, I kind of felt bad for Tyson because Percy was just, like, he didn't want him as a brother, really, but uh, at the end, he kind of um, made it up to Tyson, and they were, they were close. That was, that was really good. 
But in this book, we have the quest for the Golden Fleece because the tree that protects the border to Camp Half-Blood is dying. It was poisoned by what who we later find on find out is Lou. That the quest is kind of interesting because Percy's also looking for Grover, and he has this connection with Grover, so he would be able to see kind of like where Grover was while he was dreaming. And it turned out he was in the same place as the Golden Fleece. He was being captured by Cyclops um, while he was out looking for the great god Pan. So it was very interesting. I thought it was very funny because the uh, uh, Cyclops had captured Grover thinking he was a, a woman and he was going to keep him for his bride. So that, that was pretty funny, I found. And then we just have this whole quest through the sea and we meet some more monsters, obviously. Like there's monsters in every book. It's killing monsters. It's pretty cool. Um, we are introduced to more of Percy's powers. Like we see that he has like perfect bearings at sea. He can control the water. It's just, it's awesome. It's like, and even in the fifth book, we saw he could make like a mini cyclone. Like, isn't that awesome? It's like, oh, awesome powers. But anyways, he does end up saving Grover and finding the fleece. And at the end of the book, I was really surprised about this. When they brought the fleece and started healing tr the tree, it also healed Talia within the tree. So she came back to life. Crazy. That is so crazy. I was like, I wasn't expecting that. That was like a great ending. I jumped right into the third book, The Titan's Curse, and this is probably my least favorite book out of the five because we didn't have enough Annabeth. And as you know, Annabeth fell off a cliff battling a monster within the first 30 pages. And then we didn't see her again till the very end. Anyways, we we're introduced to some new characters. We we're introduced to Artemis, who is one of the gods, and her hunters who basically just follow her around. They're all like 12 year old immortal girls. They're like all around 12. And they help her kill monsters and that sort of thing. We also introduce to Nico and Bianca D'Angelo and we later find out in the series that they're children of Hades. Bianca is offered to become a hunter and of course she takes the offer because she will become immortal and immortality is a pretty awesome thing. You get to live forever. But I was pretty surprised about that since she and Nico seemed pretty close brother and sister and they didn't, uh, they were been without parents for a really long time. So I thought she would have stayed close with Nico. Artemis goes on a quest by herself to find and kill um, the monster that is threatening the gods. And so she does that herself because she doesn't want her hunters getting involved. She doesn't want them getting hurt. Anyways, the hunters are brought back to Camp Half-Blood. And at Camp Half-Blood, they discover, or they learn that Artemis is in trouble. That, um, some sort of trouble. Like, I think someone had a dream about this. And they learned that... Um, I think it was Zoe, one of the hunters, the main hunter. She had a dream about Artemis disappearing and being in trouble kind of thing. So automatically, they want to go on the quest. Zoe, Bianca, Percy, Talia, and Grover go on this quest to find Artemis. Percy is really on this quest to find Annabeth um, so that he can have his friend back. But throughout this quest, they encounter more monsters. Um, and I, bet, I think like halfway through the book or so, Bianca dies when they are battling an Ottoman. Um, I wasn't like extremely sad about that because we didn't really get to know Bianca that well. Like I'm sure if she uh, had appeared early on in the books, that would have been more sad. Um, but really, like we didn't get to know her character that well, and she kind of just died fairly soon after she was introduced. It was still unfortunate, but it wasn't that big of a deal to me. Then at the end of the book, we have this huge battle with uh, one of the Titans, Atlas, who turns out to be Zoe's father. Um, during this battle, Zoe is injured and she is poisoned and she dies, unfortunately. Um, at first, I wasn't a huge fan of Zoe. She was kind of, I don't know, I didn't like her that much. Um, but she did die and I, she did start to grow on me. So I was kind of sad about her death. I wasn't, like again, I wasn't overly sad because she was just introduced in this book. But still, it was unfortunate that she died. The one moment when Percy had to hold the whole sky on his shoulders, that was really crazy. That was like, whoa, I, I don't even know how like... A, how was he, how old was he, no, like 13, 13 or 14 year old kid can hold the sky on his shoulders, like, that's kind of crazy, kind of crazy. Anyways, Percy finds Annabeth, which is great, Annabeth is back in the story, thank goodness, and then we see that Luke, when battling Talia, falls off a cliff, but we later learn that he's not dead. He's not, I, I don't know, I don't know if that's because on the next book that we learn, Kronos is in it, Kronos is Luke, Luke is Kronos, Kronos has taken over Luke's body, I don't know if that's happened yet. I don't really know what happened there, so that's kind of like all a mystery. So afterwards, I jumped into the fourth book, and in this book, we are introduced to the whole concept of the labyrinth, and this is basically just like a huge maze 
kind of thing underground. It has like traps and stuff in it and different monsters. You know, it's really, really cool. And you can get, uh, you can use the labyrinth to get to like one place to another like faster. So um, the campers at Camp Half-Blood learned that Luke and the army of Kronos are trying to figure it out how to get to Camp Half-Blood to get through the border of the magical tree. They discover an entrance in their camp. So they are in trouble if Luke finds that. So Percy and Annabeth and Grover and Tyson go down into the labyrinth to try and navigate around and they try and find Daedalus who they think can help. And we later find out that Daedalus is actually their new battle instructor Quintus and he's actually an Ottoman because he's been alive for hundreds of years. And I just like, how can you do that? That is like, that's crazy. I don't even know. I guess because it's different when you're dealing with gods and stuff, but I, I think he's a half-blood, right? He's a daughter, not daughter, he's a son of Athena, I'm pretty sure. So that was fairly interesting. That was really interesting to learn. And then when he killed himself at the end, I like the labyrinth completely collapsed. I don't know how that works. If you kill the creator, you kill the maze, whatever. It's interesting to me, the whole labyrinth idea, like I said. Uh, was really interesting. I thought it was really cool. And in this book, we also learn that Luke is Kronos. Kronos is Luke. Kronos is basically taking over his body, which is like, whoa, really, really weird. Really weird. And also in this book, we have Rachel, who we, I think she's introduced in the third book, but we got to see more of her in this book. She's um, an okay character. I don't love her. I like Annabeth more, but, um, she was decent, um, she's not, like I said, not my favorite character. Anyways, we, a Grover finds Pan in this book, and within like five minutes of finding Pan, Pan dies. So that's really unfortunate for Grover, it's like his lifelong dream of chasing Pan, and then Pan dies right in front of his eyes. So he goes to spread the word of that kind of thing. And in the last book, The Last Olympian, the final book, my personal favorite, um, it's basically just one huge battle on these pages. Yeah, that's like all action, all battle, and it's awesome. It's like oh, awesome. You're like launched right into battle. Like Percy, like within, I don't know, like the first chapter, we, uh, a ship has been blown up and someone's already dead. So pretty cool. Uh, Beckendorf dies, which is unfortunate. We didn't get to see him too much. Like he's just kind of like a minor camper. Like he was ahead of one of the cabins and we do learn that there is a spy working for Kronos who is among the camp or the, the campers and of course it ends up being Selena or Selena Selena Sel, Selena something like that whatever her name is uh, one of the Aphrodite children I don't really like the Aphrodite children but they don't do anything they don't really do anything we just like check their makeup and stuff Selena wasn't too bad because she rode like rode Pegasi and she was like the best rider or something like that but she did die a hero she was fighting for their side she was fighting against the dragon and she uh helped kill it well she sacrificed herself for it um so i guess she really she died fighting for the campers and that was good and percy tried to keep that undercover so that they wouldn't know that she was really bad she didn't want to he didn't want to give her a bad rap that was nice of him to do and then just the whole book awesome battles with the dragon uh where clarice killed it pretty awesome there's just so many awesome scenes we have like the mini cyclone of percy just like makes this awesome mini cyclone and like that is really cool just to have powers like that amazing uh the hunters come back in this one to help there's centaurs there are uh, let's see we see like all the gods again at the end of the book and at the end of the book let me just say that was a very interesting ending with luke uh kind of taking back his body and being able to like Percy handing him the knife and him and he stabbed him in the one spot that he could only be killed because he bathed in the river sticks so he killed himself basically so he died a hero as well so there's lots of traitors dying heroes in the end very interesting and then at the very very end like after everything's wrapped up all the all the battles wrapped up it was very happy endings that like it's a nice change from like the, all the dystopian novels because we have like a legion who you know that's not a happy ending not gonna say why in case you haven't read it but just a nice change like we had uh rachel becoming the oracle and we had grover becoming one of the cloven elders and we had annabeth becoming becoming the official architect of olympus and that was like her one dream come true she just wanted to like rebuild something important like that and just it's amazing for her. Just imagine being in her shoes, being like, okay, we can rebuild Olympus. Like, wow. Amazing. 
And then Percy is offered to become a god, and he turns down, thankfully, because like you can't leave Annabeth or Grover, just you can't leave his friends. So I was really glad about that, but he did something even better. He made things equal between the minor gods and the big 12, and part of the reason why they were losing the war for a while because was because of the minor gods switching sides, because they did not get enough appreciation. And if like, you just think, if you were one of the minor gods, how would you feel with the other 12 getting all the attention? Like, that wouldn't feel very good. And on top of that, he made sure that the gods, if they had any children, they would give the children a son, or they would tell the children that they were a son of a god, or one of the gods, by the time they were 13. So that, that was really good. Because, like, imagine all these kids out here, they don't even know who, like, their mom or dad is, and they've never known them. Like, Percy never knew his dad until he learned that he was a half-blood. So that was really good on Percy's behalf, and I was very happy about that. It made things very even. And then just the very, very end, like, at the last page, is just, like, Annabeth and Percy leaving Camp Half-Blood. So Rachel, like I said, is the new oracle, and she comes up with this new prophecy. Um, like the oracle is speaking through her and the prophecy is talking about seven uh, people going on a, a quest of some sort so that opens up to the next series very nicely which I will be picking up sometime hopefully in the near future I'm excited to read it the ending was just fabulous although um, I did love the series there's some things I would have tweaked for one I didn't love the gods too much they were all really full of themselves and arrogant especially Zeus and especially Ares didn't like those gods too much, but Poseidon wasn't too bad in the end. He did come visit Percy for his 15th birthday in the fourth book, and that was really sweet. That was, that just made Percy's day. Overall, the gods are just not, not that nice. But I guess that's just kind of like uh, showing how ridiculous it, the gods are, really, in general. Another thing I would have changed is how the characters react to death. Like, in the first book, The Lightning Thief, when Percy thinks his mom is dead, uh, I did not think he would react like that. I think he would have been a lot more sad. Um, I guess like at first I could understand you being shocked, but after a while it would sink in that your mom is dead and then you, wouldn't you be crying like all the time? Like wouldn't you be like just locked in your room sobbing or something like that? Like if your mom died, wouldn't you be crying? I don't know, that's what I kind of thought. I thought the series was really great. And I rated each book, so the first book, Right here, The Lightning Thief, I gave an 88%. The second book, The Sea of Monsters, I also gave an 88%. The third book, The Titan's Curse, I gave an 85%. The fourth book, The Battle of the Labyrinth, Battle of the Labyrinth I gave an 89%. And the last book, The Last Olympian, I gave a 92%. So I found the average of all that, and it was 88.4%. So that's basically what I would give the entire series. So that's almost 4.5 stars. So it's a pretty good rating. Like I said, I really enjoyed it and um, hope to see you guys next time. Bye.